years have passed. The immortal head of Orpheus has been found by the Knights Templar and become their oracle. I am desire this embodied. Your fingers can This is Catonia, the world of the dark feminine. Hello and welcome to this month's Catonia Conversations. I'm your host, Breach Burke. Um, this month uh, for our conversation, um, I'm talking with um, Oriel de Finestret Bascule. Uh, Oriel is a esoteric artist uh, in many media, including painting, writing, sculpture, sound, film, and performance art. Uh, he's the writer-director of Australian originating Metamorphic Ritual Theatre Company, who have presented many major original productions based in and updating, mutating various ancient uh, mythos. Uh, creator of the Tele Quadrivium book web from Fulger, which is con uh, consists of Conjunctio, Coagula, Salve, and Distillatio, uh, and the Book of Chaos Tarot. Um, Oriel is interested in the ensoulment of objects through aesthetic obsession, the merging of mental, spiritual, and emotional relationships with creativity in the vanguard of the current resurgence of the esoteric in art with its processes of re-enchantment. Um, welcome, or it's really good to have you. Hello. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yeah, it's nice to be here. It's a little... I know it's a little bit of a of a hectic day for you, um, kind of kind of last minute, but um, but this is uh, but, it, but I'm glad that we're able to catch up. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I'm on my um, last day of my uh, recent travels in Mexico, uh, exploring the Mayan temples and art, and which has been very inspiring. And about to go home to Belgium, but I thought it would be good, easier to uh, do this interview here, where um, the the time difference is uh not quite so extreme <laughs> it's, yeah, right exactly yeah because between here and berlin i think it's like six hours it's, uh, so. belgium yeah yeah it's oh belgium sorry yeah i'm, I'm thinking yeah. yeah yeah still it's about like six hours yeah so yeah, yeah. um so this is so this is good i'm glad that we uh, were able to do this um so yeah so i i want to talk a lot about i want to talk about your work and i know as part of what we're going to do today is we want to read from some of your pieces and also um I'll play a few uh, clips uh, music clips and also um you know possibly some film clips as well um in in this uh, in this final version 
Um, but one of the interesting things is I've been looking through your work. One of the one of the big one of the big questions that I had as I was going through this is I like this idea of this um, this interaction of the the physical, uh, the imaginal, and the essential, as I think where you say it in another place. Uh, with your work, mm-hmm. the way in which you try to you talk about this insolment uh, of objects. And as I looked at some examples of some of the performance art that you've done, as well as, you know, the other visual sculptures and and um, and paintings and so forth, I, I, there just seems to be this 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 really um, fantastic idea about, you know, the way in which, because oftentimes in the West, we like to separate body and soul, you know, there's, there's this mm-hmm. idea of, of this kind of duality that's here and, um, and, and a real problem in kind of what I think of as spiritual life as, you know, this idea of transcending, somehow transcending uh, the world or getting away from the soul, you know, giving up the soul in some fashion. So I'm always um, very interested in work with the dark feminine. When I deal with the dark feminine, that's just one piece of what I consider kind of a re kind of a process. So I'm just very interested in that, in that, um, that particular theme in your work. Um, So I don't know, I want to let you talk about about your work and what your what's um, what you think is in um, important, and of course what you're you know currently working on, um, but that particular question in particular is is something I'm interested in. Yeah, well, it's a definitely a big theme in my work because I see it as a uh, sort of it's been a major problem, like with the you know the dominance of the the mainstream religions uh, with this sort of idea of the separation of the the um, the physical world and the um, the spiritual so-called spiritual world whereas um a lot of earlier more pagan beliefs um which i think you know it would be healthy to for more people to return to like have a more integrated uh view where yeah the of course there's spirit and of course there's more than just the physical but it's embodied within the physical plane and you know spirit is in all of us in you know in humans in animals in trees um rocks buildings anything and like it's all around us and um yeah we're not just like here to go because otherwise what would be the point of why would we be incarnate if not to you know do something here and and also enjoy it you know so this sort of idea of just um you know being on this earth just to get to heaven or whatever it's uh i've always found that a, a bizarre um idea and like so yeah um embodied spirituality i think is is really important uh um you know now more than ever and i guess with the the dominance of uh, virtuality as well with all the the screen based stuff in our culture i think that's another reason to get back to embodiment and i mean, I mean ironic to say that in a podcast <laughs> I guess it's like anything can be used or abused you know and um you know i think uh all the all the virtual technology is fantastic as a as an interface and a, and a map to help us navigate the territory but i also feel there's a danger in these days a lot of people are actually starting to um act as if it's the territory itself <laughs> which is perhaps problematic <laughs> yeah that's true right because yeah because that becomes you know the, the that that particular form becomes more important than um mm. than the substance mm. yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah and that that lends us to a different kind of dis- disembodiment from the um you know the one that we've we're just getting over from the the dominance of the the um mainstream religions <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's funny. It's funny. I was uh, just before when we were discussing what we were talking about um, before we began recording, and I was thinking about what poem to read. I'm hoping it's not too early to bring one in, but uh, oh, what we were talking about is actually uh, one of the poems I was considering is is really uh, related to this topic. So maybe it's it's good to have something performative right at the beginning why not yeah well hey no, no it's all it, go we'll go with the flow on this one so yeah that actually that would be a great idea if you wanted to if you okay wanted to mm-hmm. well yeah this this is from my uh the reason i'm uh wanting to read poems um in this podcast too uh is that i'm shortly launching a new book in fact by the time this podcast is actually online i'm hoping it will actually be out it's called assessors and it's um released from grail press jack grail's new um publishing label and um yeah um yeah hopefully it'll be out um by the time this is uh this is online but uh it's mostly a collection of esoteric poetry 
and accompanying art, but it's also got an exegesis on um, the magic of language, um, you know, particularly poetic language, but also um, the vibrational aspects of language, like how it's um, language can be more potent when spoken or even sung rather than just read on a page, um, you know, particularly poetry. So, um, yeah, there's also an album with the book um, for this reason so it's you know demonstrated rather than just written about and um, yeah we'll hear some pieces I guess from that later from the the fully produced pieces but I also want to just um, read live some of the other poems so this one um, relevant to what we were just talking about is called which gods but it's like god slash s like which god which gods okay Um, right okay Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, yeah, at one stage it actually changes to which, like the other way of spelling which, which <laughs> <It's> right. <laughs> um, there's yeah, quite a bit about on the album it. too, I've noticed as well. So that a wordplay, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, those are subtleties which also can you can only really fully see on the page. So they both have different advantages: the the orated and the the written versions. Hmm. What gods? Will you worship one who sits on high, master of remote sky, to judge those below from his lofty perch, or all who lives amongst us, ever piping melodies of earth? Which gods will you worship? One who calls us away from the nest and the half of the bodies we've been birthed in, or those who know the hungers of the flesh. What gods will you worship? None, nobody, nothing is sacred. Then you'll worship your car or some movie star, I suppose. Scientism, faith in the tests they have told you, while saying there's no spirit, only matter, though how it is animated, God only knows. What gods will you worship? One who is good and wise and gentle, or those who may give and grant or rend and slay, whose brethren will will you stand with in prayer, honest warriors whom you can trust to be foul as well as fair, like life's affairs, or the benevolent hypocrites of a jealous God who smites. Which gods will you worship? the distant, superior spirit of outer space or the omnipresent, embodied spirit of inner place, the gods of every river, rock and tree, of the beasts and the birds and the bees. Which gods will you worship? Those who with life's inevitable sacrifices may be appeased or he who wants you humble, compliant, on your knees, the order and control of the one true unified Lord, or the circumstantial chaos of a divinely diverse horde. Which gods will you worship but your divine self, magic mirror and the flesh worn, another spark of spirit in the temple of all form? Fantastic. <laughs> that's uh, wow. That's incredible. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, trying, uh, absorbing all of that in my mind. Uh, <laughs> well, through the sound, you know, th- trying to get the, trying to get the sense of all of that. Um, that's well, int- you, you, you can see why I wanted to bring it in at that point in the conversation. <laughs> right. Because that's, that's, because that's yeah that, that is that, that, that sort of question of, of, of embodiment there. Mm, um, mm with that with that um with that kind of a thing um so that's so that's interesting you, you have this um yeah the, the this we have we have this this idea about um I, I think one of the things that uh you're trying to get back to here is is this idea of um you know as, as I always try to tell a lot of my own students as I say you know it's about being here and it's not about being um you know it, you know that there's 
I, I don't feel like the transcendental model really does anything except um, disconnect us from everything. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, transcendence has its place or lack of place. But, um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, as a, a sort of ultimate or overall goal for life, it doesn't make much sense to me. <laughs> No, it, it it doesn't for me either. It's funny because I had kind of started out my, you know, my own journey, I suppose, year, years and years ago. God, it's been 35 years probably. Um, but I, you know, looking at that more transcendental path, because that's where I think a lot of people just start naturally. Mm. That's that's just mm. what it is. It's it's very um, unusual to, um, you know, to have these kind of pagan traditions and so forth that, you know, being being what informs you from from. Mm from child and of course culturally there, there's all kinds of assumptions and so forth um so i think it's interesting too that you're working on pieces that deal with with language um and and the way in which one works with language because language is such is kind of a funny thing because it's it's um i've always think of it as kind of a a tool we have in the toolbox right you know with, with everything yeah. else but it's it's a, it tends to be a rather overrated tool at times but um but you know because people over rely on on intellect and analysis and on on the world, yeah. you know, over the totally, world. yeah, yeah, and um, in a way, uh, you know, it might be surprising to some people uh, that I am doing, a, you know, that I've done a book about this because uh, most of my work in recent years has been all about embodiment, and um, you know, language seems more of an abstract and uh, you know, intellectual thing, and yet the angle that I'm taking on it, like, uh, is it's all about the vibrational properties of language, um, which, you know, is a much more embodied language. It's like about how, you know, how, how words feel on the tongue and how, um, you know, how they work with the breath. It's about like mantra and oration and invocation. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really about, um, embodied language. The title of the book, itself is actually i mean it's a word i just uh created or or found um <clears throat> in relation um yeah just from doing glossolalia but uh the meaning of it it's is the ecstasy of new tongues becoming flesh fleshy a fleshy tongue both the organ of speech and its modus so it's actually about you know the physical tongue in their mouth as well as the idea of languages as tongues and i mean the like the the french word lung which is uh yeah there's other similar uh words in other latin based languages that actually mean tongue and that's the root of the word language so it's actually you know literally about the the tongue and you know i think that's that's the root of all languages that you know they were more embodied originally because um you know ancient people would have been like originally like what's that you know uh the rock like what does it feel like you know what's the vibration of it and the word they came up with would have came from you know trying to vibrationally express the essence of that rock rather than you know just an abstract let's call it a you know something or other that doesn't sound like a rock so <laughs> and uh you can still see the traces of that in the older languages you know like sanskrit and hebrew and like the really old, um, less diluted languages, um, you can you can still feel that vibrational potency in them, which is why something like you know why these these tongues are used more for um, for magical purposes and for invocation often than English is because they have this pure vibrational aspect that has more um, relationship with the physical world and therefore is likely to actually affect things more. Um, no, like Sanskrit ma mantras, a lot of them are even based in the actual physiology of the way our, the, the shapes our mouth forms and the rhythm of the mantra propels our breath in a certain way. And so it's, yeah, it's a very, um, it's, it even has physiological effects that you can feel with some mantras and therefore, you know, it, that ripples outwards to affect our our environment as well. And I think, yeah, the potency of those, those ancient languages is is really profound um whereas something like english is incredibly diluted it's like uh sort of mangled mishmash of all of these uh different languages and roots that's um but it's also like really fascinating to me um 
in that way because it's got so such diverse origins and it's like bringing together all these different things so it's uh although it's um yeah not as as sort of pure it's also uh interesting just because it's um yeah it's such a such a melting pot i guess of different um different origins of of words and and sounds and you know has its its own um fascinating results because of that well yeah and yeah english is certainly um yeah, it certainly is a mixture of of a lot of different things. I mean, like a lot of a lot of European languages are are you know romance based, they're they're Latin based, um, and but and you know but English seems to be a combination of that, you know, Anglo Saxon German, you know, it's a lot of different things. But what you you were talking, what made me think of is um, is this the whole idea of muthos, okay, and the idea that muthos is is a Greek term that means what is spoken out loud, um, and that's where the term myth comes from. It doesn't really mm. have to do with um, you know, when we think of mythology, people, you know, tend to think of these, you know, these long kind of written things, but, but the, the written piece actually comes later. Everything's actually kind of meant to be sung or spoken out loud. And, yeah. um, you know, and, and even any kind of sacred thing, like even with the Celts, like, you know, they, they nothing's written down. I mean, everything is spoken. Mm. Wrote. They don't yeah. put it into that form because somehow mm. that, that changes it. But also, yeah, the idea of mantra as well. I mean, you know, um, mantra does definitely have a, 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 profound effect on the body and on on how um you know and, and certainly it makes a lot of sense and of course hebrew is a language that um i mean if, if you look at you know sefer yetzara i mean it's the whole idea that that's the the building blocks of the universe is actually is actually the sound mm. so yeah. Um, so yeah so it's it's a really it's it's, it's fascinating yeah. as a concept there it's um um i think i also wanted to talk a little bit about um because mm -hmm. obviously one of the sub the subject that I like to talk about here has to do with the feminine and with the dark feminine. And, um, you know, in looking, like I said, you know, you have a, a, a fantastic array of, of work of these uh, different female figures or composite figures. Like I see it like a, you had like a Bridget Sarasvati and you have, um, you know, just, you know, some of this other one, um, Neon Narasimi uh, Nefertum, you have, you know, some of these paintings that you have um uh you know this uh, rebirth of venus is, is fantastic um and then time and fate it was just a lot of the ways in which you would take these um these kind of feminine figures and you know move them into these these kinds of these kinds of these kinds of mixed forms where i see these kind of combinations of these kind of um almost gnostic figures like you know aeon or phanus or Abraxas mm. and and kind of moving that in with um like you have the one uh that, that one harpy sculpture you have which is really wonderful um with, right. the, with the serpent and the lion down in the front mm -hmm. which I feel like that that's yeah. just really incredible or the naga nest you know the 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 women with the serpent um yeah but so i i'm just you know because i see a whole lot of i uh, feel like a lot of whole you know um kundalini vibes certainly from from looking at a lot of that and uh just just this idea um you know this this way in which the feminine kind of informs this this ensoulment. Can you actually talk a little bit about that? Because I because I remember one thing David did say to me was that you actually have a quite interesting view on the dark feminine. So I'm interested to hear what you have to say on that. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it's interesting that you uh, yeah you bring up Kundalini in relation to that as well because I mean that's uh, yeah it's definitely something that really informs a lot of my work um, and that you know, is uh, traditionally considered a, a feminine force. And, yeah, I, I feel that. Um, um, and that, yeah, I mean, kundalini energy is really important to me because it's like um, it's, you know, it's the energy within the within that impels the the physical world and, well, particularly, the you know, the physical body. And so to me that's really where where spirit and matter actually come together within the human because it's like, you know, kundalini is something um transphysical and yet it goes through the physical form and and moves and affects the physical form um yeah and i i mean i also work a lot in a lot of my arts with um eroticism and uh, so that you know that is also the the primal energy that goes through that and it's also the you know the primal creative energy um so as an artist and you know particularly as a magical artist i think it's you know, it's really important um, aspect. You know, I mean, it's called uh, also Shakti is uh, almost analogous in some of the chantras with Kundalini. So it's like, a, um, you know, that's like the basic, the primal feminine force. And, and then we also have um, Sekhem uh, in ancient Egypt, which, you know, is power, but it's 
Um, it was it is particularly you know a fiery energy, and it's um, it's also considered a feminine force, and is often like yeah um, correlated with um, Shakti, and um, yeah it's the it's where Sekhmet's name also comes from is Sekhem you know as the powerful one, so that that uh, fiery feminine force that um, you know impels impels us, uh, you know, our, it's like our, our sexual and creative energy. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a very, a very feminine essence, definitely. Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, I think it really, like, wells, wells up from, you know, it's from below. It's like moving up from the earth and up from the um, base chakra to the crown. So it's like, a, um, yeah, it's... It has chthonic sources, I guess. So that's where, like, the dark feminine um, is very related to this concept. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, certainly with Kundalini, and um, and I see it in some of the other images that you have as well. I mean, just kind of these ways of these these female, especially these very erotic feminine figures that kind of come out of these natural kind of structures, like kind of in, entwined with tree branches or, or entwined with, um, it's just, it's just done in, in, in kind of a way uh, that is, is, is just fantastic because you kind of have this idea of, you, you know, in one of them, it might, it might've been the, the rebirth of Venus. I don't have it in front of me right now, but there's one, there's kind of like, it has almost like a celestial kind of an image that kind of almost bleeds out into something that, that, that feels more elemental, you know what I mean? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Way. Um, yeah, it, it's um, it's 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 interesting. Um, so yeah, because you're mentioning that the you know the way yeah, because there's a lot of your your pieces also like I think your what, what's your site called um, um, Esoterotica, yeah, which is uh, which is which is cool the way that those those two yeah. words come together. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, because because eros I think is is a big is a big component also when it comes to the feminine and when it comes to the dark feminine and mm. and how it um, informs it. Um, yeah. because it's that, it's that thing that's supposed to be, you know, sinful or the thing that, you know, people in culture don't, mm-hmm. don't necessarily deal with, but, but at the same time, it's, it's just seems to me, it's, it's very fundamental to, um, to life itself or to, to experiencing life itself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that term actually, uh, that I came up with esoterotica, um, it, uh, that also relates to Kundalini, I think, because, um, the idea of of the the word is that I mean you could say that it's that it's paradoxical because the esoteric is sort of you know what's um what's hidden and the erotic is normally considered you know very physical um so you could say well that's you know that's um that's exoteric <laughs> and yet <laughs> right. what I'm trying to get at with my art is you know the the actual uh energy the the fiery energy within sexuality so rather than just pre- rather than just um creating imagery or words about you know the interaction of physical forms it's like the energy within that the spirit within and the the kundalini within that's actually moving those forms and depicting that as well which is why i sort of often combine um figurative and, and abstract elements to um you know to to depict the energetic as well as physical aspects um and and how they interrelate yeah so i think that uh that concept is inherent in the term esoterotica as well okay um <clears throat> yeah i was also thinking too because at this point um i'm I think um the this was just looking at your current work that you're putting out um the, and the and the album that's associated with it um the way in which, because uh, like I said, there's there's a whole, there's a whole there's a whole different variety of things, and like uh, like I, like we both like you said earlier, and like and I had noted that there there's a lot of language play um, in these particular things, um, but you do have a few pieces in here that that do relate specifically to the feminine or to the dark feminine. Um, you've got like Hecate, and you've got um, this uh, Volva uh, Valu, um, Valuspa. Um, I was thinking, do you think at this point it would be good to to play something just to see? Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me try. Um, I think I would like to do the, um, let's see. I think I'd like to do the Volva Valuspa. That's, that's cool with you. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Should I, uh, introduce what it's about? Um, yeah, that would be great. You play it. Um, okay. Yeah. So the Volva, um, spelt with an O rather than a U, 
were female, but it's also the origin of the the, the word vulva with a with a U. Uh, the vulva were female seers in the Nordic traditions. So to the Vikings, uh, yeah, the vulva were those uh, were the the seers. Who, who gave the prophecies. And Velaspa, the other name in the title, is the most renowned of the vulva um, who pronounced a prominent section of the Eddas. And there's a theory that the Delphic Oracle also received her prophetic trance not just from nasal imbibement from the intoxicating fumes arising from the crack in the earth below, but also from vaginal fumigation. And that's yeah, that could be a reason why she was perched on this high tripod in Delphi. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, then we can also compare the high seat of prophecy in Norse traditions because um, yeah, traditionally the vulva would also sit on a very high seat above everyone else and do her prophecies from there. So yeah, I mean it's speculative on my part, but I thought maybe that could also be for the this same um, reason. And um, yeah, this this idea comes um, into the end of the poem um, with uterus utterance indicate yoni prophecy. Um, so it's a very sort of um, physicalized and directly feminine aspect of the prophetic trance. Um, so yeah, this this piece is intended as a chant for oracular workings to be uttered rhythmically and hypnotically begun as a whisper and rising with the energy by other participants to help inspire the Cirrus's trance. Now here is the track Volva Velaspa from the album Ashesages, which accompanies the book of the same name. Volva Velaspa Hag Volva Velaspa Vispa Volva Velaspa Dark the gate of the weight for the boat with your shadow. Volva Velaspa, here. Volva Velaspa, here. Volva Velaspa, via. Left to the weft of the weave neath the mounds in the meadow. Volva Velaspa, via. Volva Velaspa vibrates. Volva Velaspa revels. Jewress level to the tunnel of your ingress. Volva Velaspa reveal. Vipers wending unseal bliss. Volpa vixen vindicate. Hymen sundered. By spirits in smoke, utterance throated, uterus utterance indicate yoni prophecy. Volva velaspa hakin, volva velaspa whisper, volva velaspa darken the gate of the weight for the boat with your shadow. Volva Velaspa here. Volva Velaspa Kamsita. Volva Velaspa Via. Left to the west of the weed neath the mound in the meadow. Volva Velaspa Via. Volva Velaspa Vigil. Volva Velaspa Revel. Jewress level to the tunnel of your ingress. That one, I had really, really liked that one. Um, it was, uh, you know, the, um, yeah, the, 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 the uterus and the utterance that, 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 mm. that just kind of got me right. I was like, I was like, oh, that's, that's really, it's really great. Um, how that, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the, the feeling of that, you know what I mean? Cause I think it's more about, it's more about the feeling than trying to, trying to analyze it, but it, yeah, it's, yeah. You know, how it's felt. Um, okay. Um, so just, okay. So I'm looking at the kind of work that you're doing now, like where you're going with things you've got this, like I said, you've got this new work actually, uh, you know what, I think I would like to talk a little bit about just maybe think about your performance art. 
mm-hmm. and the kind of things that you um the kind of themes that you are are doing with that or you know um you know with respect to the dark feminine or anything like what what's the you know what what kind of work do you have i know you mentioned something about a um well i think actually it was like a baphomet and orpheus film but i think there's other live performance art and that you have that you've done as well yeah yeah absolutely and that that film uh began as a as a ritual theater piece originally um back in 2012 and 13 before i eventually turned it into a film um but yeah, uh, I do a lot of different um, ritual theatre and um, also music, so uh, it, it varies a lot. Um, also, according to where I'm performing and the the kind of um, local mythologies and spiritualities there, um, but also also according to who I'm working with. Um, so yeah, in Belgium, I'm often performing with other musicians there, and you know sometimes when I'm travelling, but uh, then yeah. Uh, when I'm traveling, I'm often also performing alone. But the the recent one that I've um, been doing is actually related to Hecate. Um, so it's interesting that you bring it up just after we just mentioned her because, um, yeah, um, I'm actually doing it in just a couple of weeks, although the, it'll probably be done by the time this goes online. But um, it's a piece called Skin Surface Substance, which I've only done a few times, but it's, exploring the relationship between the the surface of things you know the the skin and then peeling away the layers of that and so like I interact with um with some of my artwork with some paintings and um tearing away layers of them as well um um, just yeah looking at the different the different layers of reality from the surface you know through the different layers of skin to, to bones, but then also stripping that away and even even stripping away you know, the, the personality and the ego and gradually getting, you know, towards some, um, you know, nothing ultimately. <laughs> <laughs> and, towards whatever and, that and, core is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but then also also back into the world of form from that, which is, which is you know, as important, of course. And, and um, yeah, so it's... Uh, it is a devotional work to Hecate. I use, um, yeah, I, uh, I chant to her, and um, there's some Bhutto dance in it as well. And um, yeah, the interaction of the artwork. So it's a combination of of different elements. And yeah, I've just done it a few times, and it's always different. And I'm looking forward to uh, doing it again soon when I get back to Europe at this um, Death and Rebirth Festival in Amsterdam. Uh, well done, but yeah. Um, there, I know you have some images from some of them on your website, and um, yeah, you know, yeah. um, you have this one, um, Hecate, um, what is it, uh, Hecate Triformis, I think it is, you know, or Triforma, um, it, that uh, it, it's a, I know it's a sculpture, but I, you have this one that I saw where it actually kind of fills the entire room, like there's a, there's a room filled with chairs, and you've got that kind of sculpture up there, and you've got the projections kind of all along you know oh uh, okay yeah 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 i know what you mean yeah yeah um, that, that was, yeah that was... i mean yeah sometimes i do that do use project actually i'm using projections in in this piece as well because um some of the stop animation i did with transforming that sculpture but yeah i mean it might be a good point at which to talk about the the, the sculpture itself actually and the the mm-hmm. other works at my place in Belgium because that's another kind of um ongoing project that's important for me at the moment is um yeah I have a a small patch of forest a chalet in a small patch of forest um in southern Belgium and I'm creating a, a sculpture garden there like a esoteric sculpture garden so I made a um a Hecate statue there that's about um seven and a half feet tall um with the the three heads and six arms and everything and uh also a um Kanana statue and a whole lot of uh smaller works as well so um yeah when i when i've got more happening i'm going to um open that to the public in a few years i hope as a as a sculpture garden and in the meantime i'm just having um i'm having little sabbath uh gatherings there you know with uh 20 or so magicians sort of getting together um usually on um Lamas on on Lugnasad for the to celebrate the harvest and um, we have a few days where everyone camps there and we do workshops in the day and rituals at night and sometimes some sort of immersive performance stuff so yeah that's a lot of fun and um, yeah I want to keep developing that place 
Um, and uh, yeah, I think of it as a, you know, a sculpture garden rather than a sculpture park, although it, maybe a sculpture uh, forest might be even more uh, appropriate because it's really about integrating the works with nature. I mean, the Hecate statue is the base is like a, uh, the base of a tree with the the roots serpentine roots coming out the bottom from the the webby kind of lacy skirts um so yeah it's very um yeah i mean that's actually a very chthonic uh piece as well i mean it's uh it's a statue of um hecate reschthone which is like the um not just uh chthonia like hecate of the underworld but hecate the form of hecate that actually erupts up out of the underworld so i mean she's obviously on the surface because she's there in the in the forest but um but yeah with these serpentine roots and yeah i actually saw her in an underworld astral journey um like underground there at the the place where i'm living and then she erupted in the journey up to the surface and then i was like okay i thought i thought it was going to be someone else but that's the first statue i have to make because it's like you know she wants to be born she wants to manifest on the surface to come up from the underworld and yeah then um sarita later mentioned this uh this epithet for her uh, reshtathone which is actually like erupting up out of the earth um, mm -hmm. so i thought okay well yeah that's the that's the aspect of heck it, it is but, yeah. yeah i was wondering because i saw that um I, I saw the piece and i saw the the um the epithet and i just thought oh i haven't i haven't heard that one before the reshtheon like i hadn't i hadn't reshtathon it, it, it hadn't um hadn't wasn't quite sure because I, i'm looking at it was more like in terms of um the rex because I, I look at that as kind of like you know rulership but but yeah but you're talking about more as a bursting out so that's what that is yeah 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 totally yeah, in yeah. term so that's um yeah, that that was an interesting. You have you have a few interesting um, uh, Hecate uh, images. Um, there's there was one I was looking at. I think it's one that was on somebody's book cover at one point um, that you had mentioned. Um, it was one of them. Uh, that, yeah, yeah, but the, yeah, that's uh, my oil painting of of Hecate. Yeah, also with the the three heads and the um, the six arms, and that's uh, yeah, that's on the um, only on the Spanish language edition actually of of Jack Grail's Hecateon. Because yeah, he okay, that was it. Yeah, published that earlier with um, you know, with other art, and um, they also used used that um in the Spanish edition, but then they added a um, a dust jacket with my painting as well. But that um that painting is also in my new book, the the poetry one, the Sejas one. Um, it accompanies the the verse um the verses about Hecate, uh, which. We'll hear later in the the musical track from the album, and there's also like um, some images of the statue and the the bronze and the various like different um, mm -hmm. artworks I've done with her. Yeah, because there was one that one in particular had got struck me because it was the way her faces were, because it was the way the eyes were actually, because some of them the eyes they're almost like looking at each other in kind of this this way, like and rather than looking all of them looking out, they're almost kind of all looking at each other, which I thought was, <laughs> right, right. was it was interesting. It was like they all they all just kind of yeah, it, it was it, I you know normally it, you know you just kind of have these these three faces that are kind of going going out, but these kind they were all yeah. kind of looking at each other, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, yeah, they're kind of both, I guess, because they're facing outwards and yet inwards at the same time. It's just what I was trying to convey. Yeah. Under that, yeah. Okay, that, that, that's quite interesting. Um, so, so okay, so, um, so yeah. So, is there anything else we'd like to talk about with regard to? Because um, we just talked about, you know, your 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 pieces that you have uh, in Belgium. And um and and this the the sculpture I think sculpture garden is probably appropriate I mean it was making me think of the like the Japanese sculpture like the Japanese kinds of gardens where everything is kind of woven into mm. the landscape rather than yeah yeah being, being quite separated out you know yeah yeah totally yeah yeah and um so um I'm just so I'm just curious like what else you know um you know especially with with your um with your latest work is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or highlight at this point um with regard to that uh well in, i mean in relation to the the sculpture garden um uh some of the people listening to this would already probably know about um uh how i s actually suffered this catastrophic uh, vandalism at the place uh, last year 
um yeah it was a really horrible thing because i just uh came home from a few days in the city and um yeah and some i guess i guess uh drunk teenagers or something had like come into the place which is weird because you know it's really in the middle of nowhere but um you know there's sort of redneck farmers around as well and stuff and um yeah some kids had come in and uh they toppled the Sinanos statue, um, so that was really a mess. And then Hecate, um, probably because of the, you know, the actual structure with the skeleton and the and the tree, they, um, yeah, they, uh, the torso wasn't damaged, but they uh, smashed uh, some of the hands off and smashed in the faces. Mm. And um, yeah, this was like was such a horrific thing to come home to, of course. Um, and yeah, yeah, I was just you know, screaming and then in tears and everything for ages. But um, eventually I, I sort of, I was feeling like, how, you know, how can this even happen, you know, because these are, statues, these are devotional statues. Like, you know, how could Hecate like let that happen to a statue that was created as a devotion to her? And then I was like, well, okay, she's, you know, she's a goddess of of destruction and creation of of death and rebirth. And so it's like, you know how can i uh you know rebirth this what what can i get from this this as a transformation um and yeah and, and you know i also felt like i had to do this rather than you know otherwise it would have just been like uh you know like falling into despair about the whole thing so it was like i had to not only like you know i realized fairly soon that i could um i could fix it uh i could fix the faces fairly easily because there were enough larger fragments that I could piece most of them together and then fill in the gaps with epoxy and stuff and yeah it was a bit of a bit of work but it was possible um wasn't just like starting the whole thing again because it was a, originally a six-month job that statue um but uh yeah then I thought okay well rather than just you know do what I've already done again what can I you know what else what what creative opportunity is there in this as a, as a transformation and I had um, several skulls of different animals around, and I happened to have like a, a, a dog. Well, it was, I mean, it was actually a fox, but still canine um, skull and a horse skull, which are two of her most common zoomorphic forms as heads. And then I also had like a whole lot of um, clay serpents because I'd been putting some of them them amidst the roots to make them even more serpentine. Um, so yeah, from the cracked faces, I had. Um, the, the serpent coming out of one of them and then the fox skull out of another and then the horse skull out of another. And then as I repaired the faces back to their original human forms, I um, stop animated the process and then reversed it. So the, yeah, the, the film work that I have in the end is um, the human faces cracking and then gradually fragmenting and coming apart and the, the animal skulls sort of bursting out from inside um yeah so that was um i was happy that i was able to get something um creative from from that destruction um yeah and um that's actually part of the the, the film work that i'm using in the the Hecate performance yeah I'm that's sure. it's actually quite alchemical really when you think about it i mm, mean it's the yeah. idea of taking you know, well, I mean, taking something that's that's you know that's 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 been destroyed or that's fallen apart or that's mm. you know, might be considered waste at some point, and then and transmuting it into something else. Yeah, know? yeah. So that's um, yeah. I, I saw some of the images of that as well on the website, and I thought, oh wow, that's really you know that that that, that was really fantastic. What you ended up doing with that in the end, um, with, the, yeah. with the with the skulls, I thought that was really. Um, I thought that actually that that just seems like that was. That almost seemed it. It, um, it almost felt it feels intended. You know what I mean? Not by you, but just you know, it just seems like yeah, that's yeah, it. yeah. Well, that's just like why I had to do it because it was almost like a a test of faith in a way. Because it was like, how can how can this happen to to the statue? How could Hecate allow it? And so it was like, okay, well, there has to be a reason. You know, there has to be um, you know something that can be um, got from this experience. Well, I find truthfully, I, I'm not. In my personal devotions, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm more about the Morrigan and I'm about more about Kali and, and the different um, aspects of the, the Matrikas and so forth from my, from my own personal worship. Um, but I know people, a lot of people who have gotten involved in um, Hecate worship. And, and it, it's very funny how that, 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 that seems to actually be the theme is that they, they, they may um, 
appeal to Hecate for a particular purpose, but whatever they're appealing for ends up getting kind of destroyed in the process. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that, yeah. That, that does seem to be kind of her her way. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, no, not always, but yeah, there's that that transformative aspect. Yeah, right. Uh, because yeah, because yeah, and I think I think she has affinities, strong affinities with Carly in that way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, there's even you know. The, uh visual correlations i guess with the you know when it's the three-faced form because of all the arms and um yeah i've always been very into um arachnian deities so i sort of see both kali and um um and hecate as and also the three fates as as sort of you know very arachnian deities because um yeah the the multiple armed uh thing but also the um also the creative destroy creative destroyer aspect, you know, that they they're devouring and consuming, but also very creative in the way that, you know, spiders weave webs and you know, weaving the web of fate time and yeah. Mm -hmm. What follows is the track Hecate from the album accompanying the book A Shesagis. <laughs>
talking about here was these uh, you have a you have new you have this uh, film uh solve coagula um i saw again i saw some images from that as well um and this it just looks it looks like that was another thing that was a performance piece that's actually become a film is that correct yeah originally it was um yeah and i had done film from ritual theater before but they were more like um capturing the live show um from footage from performances and dress rehearsals whereas this was actually like recreated entirely as a film uh so yeah i mean you know different sets went to different places in the world to to film parts like you know including the the maritza river in bulgaria because it used to be the hebris river which was the place where um off his head was thrown into the river when the Maynards tore him apart. So I wanted to take it back to the kind of mythogeographical um, source for that scene. And yeah, there's some um, so bits were filmed there and in you know, Portugal and all different places. And yeah, everything was sort of uh, uh, recreated entirely for the camera. Um, you know, it was using film as a, as a medium in itself rather than just um, kept trying to capture a, a theater piece. And um, yeah, so it's the, the first sort of full length future film I've made. Uh, it's about the myth of Orpheus, but uh, it's also about Baphomet because it actually begins with the ending of the traditional Greek myth, Greek or Thracian myth of Orpheus, uh, where he's torn apart by the Maenads and, um, you know, with some flashbacks uh, leading up to that. But um, yeah, then the second act is actually. Um, a few millennia later, where 
Um, because yeah, when I heard that myth, even as a child, I also I always wondered what happened uh, to the head of Orpheus because he'd already been to the underworld. He couldn't die, and yet he was torn apart. So he floated off down the river. Still, his head floated off down the river, still singing. And I thought, what a strange state to be in, because he's like, um, he's still incarnate. He's still in the physical world and can't die, but. Uh, He's just a head, so he's disembodied, and this is a, a really interesting paradox. So I was like, well, what became of this, this um, you know, disembodied, immortal head? And um, yeah, then years later, I was thinking about the the Baphomet head that the um, the Templars purportedly took Oracle from. So I've made this uh, speculative connection there that um, that's actually you know the head of Orpheus thousands of years later. Um, and yeah, so the second act of my film. Um, the Orpheus head uh, create wants to create a new body because uh, you know he's realised of after millennia of being dis discarnate, um, well not not discarnate rather, but just being a head, but still being, being in the world of the flesh. <laughs> yeah, the importance of being a head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the importance of of the body and of touch and of of presence, because I think it was his lack of presence, his sort of being in this in stuck in the past and and his loss of Iridici, that was, I think, the reason why the Mainers tore him apart, because they were just like, you know, primal creatures of the of the earth and and of the here and now. So they couldn't understand that, you know, he was he was already just like a singing head. He wasn't present or embodied. So they were like, okay, you want to be a singing head? Then <laughs> fine, you know. And, um, <laughs> right. Yeah, tore him apart. So uh yeah, now now after millennia, he sort of realised the importance of the body and, and, and of touch and, and of presence in the in the physical world. And so uh, he creates a new body, but it's through um, through vicarious experience of other people enjoying their bodies because because um, the only senses he has left are those in the head. You know, so like you know, sight and and hearing, and um, you know, he doesn't have hands or or touch. So he's using the senses in his head, which have become heightened from only being a head, to um, have this e vicarious experience of having a body again, um, and so to represent that visually in the film, have like uh, other people's bodies joining together to form this uh, composite body uh, for for him, and yeah, I mean that's why also why it becomes like a hermaphroditic um, Baphomet figure because it's male and female figures that are joining uniting to create this composite um this com composite uh baphomet figure um beneath the head um yeah so it's like it this the film is also continuing the the themes of you know embodiment re-embodiment and um the integration of of spirit and matter and mind and uh, and the voice because there's also a singer as Orpheus, so it's a, a musical film too. Yeah, and um, and and Baphomet's interesting to to pair uh, with Orpheus in that way. I mean, I'm glad I'm glad you explained that because I had seen some of the some of the bits and I had seen some of the way that the bodies were put together for for that, um, which was I was like, wow, that's 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 very very visually impressive. It's very cool, and um, but you know, but Baphomet, of course, when I think of Baphomet, you know, we're talking about possibilities of incarnation, right? I mean, Baphomet. Mm, yeah. Is, like you said, yeah, I mean, they like, seem like very different figures. Um, yeah. Uh, at first, um, but yeah, then when I look deeper, deeper into the Orphic mysteries, I really realize they're not actually as far apart as you would think, because uh, there was this whole sort of split that happened in classical times between the sort of Orphic mysteries and the Dionysus mysteries, and then um, you know Nietzsche kind of like also brought that even further with this contrast between you know the Apollonic and the Dionysian aspects, and the you know obviously the Apollonic with the lyre and and everything is is related to the Orphic traditions as well. But if you actually go back, uh, you know pre pre classical Greece to the ancient Thracian myths of Orpheus, um, you realize that. Actually, it was originally totally entwined with the Dionys Dionysian uh, mysteries, and that's like another sort of separation between this, you know, intellectual um, and and sort of cosmic thing, and you know, the more earthy, ecstatic currents um, that's happened over time. So it's, um, yeah, um, they were actually entwined because uh, um, Orpheus in Thrace. I know someone's trying to read me. 
so yeah, I mean, Orpheus was originally a figure from Thracian mythology, and in ancient Thrace, um, Orpheus was originally a king, apparently, um, and the the Thracian kings were actually avatars of Dionysus. Like the spirit of Dionysus was considered to incarnate in the king and then be passed on when the king was richly sacrificed to the next king. Um, so, yeah, uh, this and the fact that the king was sacrificed as well, it seems like, and that Dionysus was also torn apart and reborn. You mm -hmm, can see yeah. that, yeah, Orpheus was actually originally very intrinsic to the um, to the Dionysian mysteries and that, like, you know, the, the later sort of got separated out into these two different sort of mystery schools that they were actually originally united. So, um, yeah, when you look at these origins, then um, in that way, you know, Baphomet is not so far removed from Orpheus and I guess I'm trying to bring those currents back together as well. And yeah, interesting because, like I said, I hadn't I hadn't really thought about that angle of it because I know that there's I I have a chapter in my own book about where I, I talk a lot about the intersections between Orpheus and Dionysus and and um, and and Apollo, but that was one I had not really thought about right there. You know, with the um, with the tearing apart of the king that makes actually makes a tremendous amount of sense um, in mm -hmm. terms of that. But I mean, I also know that that the ancient Greeks kind of saw uh, Thrace as kind of a different like like they were foreigners, even though it's northern Greece, it's kind of like they were they were. Yeah. Foreigners to that um and and it does seem like the um Dionysian current at least the way it ended up in Athens and in places like that well like a lot of it they end up kind of the state ritual of course is much more watered down than what you know yeah. what the mystery is um mm -hmm. even though you may retain uh, some element of that um but um but that's interesting too because yeah because because Baphomet you have well, one of the pieces I noticed from your your um that, that you said is going to be in the, your current book is um what was it called? Um, Dance of the New Flesh, I think it was. And yeah, that, yeah. that one was very baphometic to me when I was looking at yeah, it. Yeah, well, that's actually from the um, Sobe Equagula film. It's like, uh, yeah, um, the the only poem that's actually been, because, yeah, the whole film is, uh, is in song. So I wanted to, like, carry some element through to the um, uh, to the book and album. I was not dead, yet went to the guard of the gates of the realm of the king. But I think said.
So, well, thank you very much, uh, Oriel. I really appreciate you um, taking the time, you know, before you have to to dash off back to back to the airport to um, to chat with me today um, about this stuff. This has all been uh, really, really interesting stuff, and I want to encourage um, listeners. We're going to have, uh, you know, I'll have links to everything, um, you know, to your site and to um, to the Bandcamp, and you know, for the album, and and uh, of course, when you have a link for the new book, we can put that up as well. Um, you know, just so you can um, to, to follow along, because the because the work really is is quite fascinating, and I think that you know there's a lot visually that we there's a lot we can talk about, but visually, I think it, I think it needs to be seen by people, you know, and and, and looked at that way. So um, so thank you very much again. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. It's been a great chat, and um, yeah. Okay, so I will stop. Thanks recording. to the the listeners out there as well. Okay, thank you very okay. much.